How many of you are Bob Dylan fans? Wow. Like you, I'm a fan. And in 1997, someone asked me a question about Dylan that changed my professional life. I had been at MTV for over a year, but I had not been able to penetrate the assertive culture of the place. I had just arrived in New York City, and I was still shy and reticent. Several executives were sitting in a conference room on the 20th floor, discussing a show about rock and roll movies. Now, usually, I didn't say much in meetings, but I couldn't contain my passion when the subject of Dylan films came up. My suggestion for a film was met with stone-cold silence. After what seemed like a painful eternity, someone finally asked, Nusrat, how would you know anything about Bob Dylan? This time, it was my turn to be stunned. I went to an exclusive British school in India, and I grew up on a steady diet of Western culture. I listened to everything from Leonard Cohen to Bruce Springsteen. But Bob Dylan and David Bowie were the twin gods of my adolescence. I was obsessed with everything about them. So the question, how would I know anything about Bob Dylan, sounded really strange. But in that moment, I realized the reason for my lack of traction at MTV. People had assumed an image of me because I was from India, a land of snake charmers and elephants and extreme poverty. And they didn't think I could know anything about Bob Dylan or American pop music. In fact, I realized that most Americans didn't know much about the world itself. And indeed, while we beamed MTV programming into 150 countries, there was no global pop music on the channel in the USA. This insight informed the rest of my career at MTV and is responsible for whatever impact my work has had since. We live in troubled times. The world is riddled with disparity, hatred, and violence. Never have we been so polarized by ideological differences or bombarded with so much noise. We see all these acts of terrorism. Muslims being seen praying in the streets as a crowd of In this swirling echo chamber of allegations and outrage, fake news and misinformation, it's hard to parse the truth from lies. It's easy to be misled, to be angry instead of empathetic, and to hate instead of love. But I believe that many of our conflicts could be reduced if we looked for the truth, and if we gave voice to the absent. Let me give you two examples of recent issues that are causing so much debate and anxiety in our world. First, the Syrian refugee crisis. These are some of the falsehoods associated with one of the biggest humanitarian tragedies of our times. In public discourse, political rhetoric, and media debate. There is one voice that is conspicuously absent, the voice of refugees themselves. Most of us form our opinions about refugees without having met a single one of them or listening to what they have to say. We would be surprised if we looked at the situation from their perspective, and if we gave them voice.
Disturbed by the enormity of this tragedy, I decided to hear directly from the Syrian refugees. And last year, I flew to Lebanon to volunteer at a Syrian refugee camp. And what I discovered completely changed my impression of these unfortunate people. All that these kids, men and women, want to do is to survive the day. Most of them dream of returning home to Syria. Most of them view America and the West as saviors who can alleviate the horrors that they have lived through. And yet, we never hear their voices while deciding their fate. The second example I'd like to give you is the image that has been created of Muslims post 9-11, especially the treatment of women in Islam. Now, as a media executive based in New York City, I've had a front row seat to the systematic and subversive programming of the Western mind about the way Islam treats Muslim women. Here are some impressions. The fact is that most Americans and a high percentage of Europeans know very little about Muslims and have personally never interacted with a Muslim woman. And unfortunately, the voices of everyday Muslims, especially women, are missing from the dialogue and cannot counteract the tropes and misinformation. But here are some clarifying facts if we chose to dig deeper. For most of my career at MTV, I've created platforms for unheard music and amplified voices missing from the conversation. We created MTV World to bring pop music and culture from around the planet to America and Europe, whether it be K-pop or Cumbia or Bollywood. But most importantly, we humanized countries and cultures that were being demonized by the media through stereotypical and one-dimensional depictions. We created a documentary series called Rebel Music, the stories of young musicians and activists fighting oppression and injustice in turbulent countries. These unheard voices presented their cultures in a new light, and their stories have been viewed millions of times since. But the episode that most surprised and impacted American audiences was rebel music Native America. The story of indigenous musicians coming of age to reclaim their destiny. As indigenous people, we've been dehumanized so much. And this music is a powerful tool to express our humanity. We are the voices of the voiceless. You are not free from violence anywhere, and that's what I want to change here in Australia. They give us a fake democracy. It's not real. Corruption, the malversation, the injustice. Senegalese youth was ready, ready for change, ready for revolution. Uh, 
until we created this documentary, the depiction of Native Americans was brutally one-dimensional. A ravaged and embittered community whose lands and culture had been plundered and their voices silenced. We changed that image by inviting their youth to speak for themselves in the film Seventh Generation Rising. And for the first time, America saw an inspiring vision of its indigenous people. We gave voice to an important segment of our country that had been invisible. In creating Rebel Music, we wanted to tell all sides of the stories we were covering, but most importantly, bring unheard voices to the forefront. In Afghanistan, we gave the microphone to its young women, and we asked their tormentors, the Taliban, to explain themselves. In Egypt, during the Second Revolution, we heard the young liberal perspective, but we took security risks to also include the voices of the Muslim Brotherhood. And in Turkey, we heard from the young conservatives supporting Erdogan, but also those who vehemently opposed his repressive regime. It's important to listen to a point of view before we decide to condemn or accept it. But it's critical to hear the voices of the human beings whose lives we hold in balance. It is my belief, after years of work amplifying the unheard, that we all need to help correct the inequity of voices and democratize media. We have an urgent responsibility to seek out and amplify the voices of the voiceless. In this cacophony of noise, I want to, you to ask yourself a very important question. Are you hearing the voice of those we are passing judgment on? If not, I want you to seek that voice Listen to it and understand what it's saying. And if you think it's not being represented, I want you to be bold. Take a leap of faith and speak on its behalf. In doing so, we will become vigilantes of facts rather than fiction. Champions of humanity and creators of an authentic new narrative in which the voices of the others are also represented and our decisions are based on an egalitarian distribution of truth. And in listening to the voices of the voiceless, we might find that we are engaged in a conversation with them rather than a war 